Hi, this is Larry Bauer, Chief Executive Officer of the Family Medicine Education Consortium, and I'm delighted today to be talking with Dr. Joseph Sugar, who's a family physician with Eisenhower Health in Rancho Mirage, California. He's currently Vice President for Primary Care. Dr. Sugar, thanks so much for joining with us today. You're welcome, Larry. So we've been talking, you and I, I've heard a number of your presentations over the last couple years about the new nutritional science and its implications for uh, the care that you provide your uh, patients in your uh, family practice setting. Could you sort of introduce us to uh, that new science? Well, happy to, Larry. I think the starting point is to appreciate that the large burden of chronic disease that we have today is largely due to our lifestyle. Uh, and the biggest part of that is our nutrition. Uh, we evolved to eat the food of nature. Uh, our evolutionary body is designed, our gastrointestinal system is designed to eat the food that exists in nature. Uh, for 98% of the time Homo sapiens has been on Earth, we were hunter-gatherers, hunting and gathering various food of nature, uh, plants, fruits, nuts, uh, meat, fish, uh, and, uh, and we ate those, typically even with one meal a day. And what has happened is our cultural evolution since the agrarian age and then especially since the industrial age has created lifestyles which have resulted in an enormous burden of chronic disease. The majority of Americans are overweight and over one-third are obese. We have an epidemic of type 2 diabetes. Uh, one out of three of us uh, would have Alzheimer's dementia by age 85. That's predicted to go to 50% because having type 2 diabetes quadruples your risk for Alzheimer's dementia at any age as a senior. We're even seeing chronic disease now rampant in children with overweight, uh, obesity, fatty liver, and type 2 diabetes. Uh, we are becoming sicker. Uh, Daniel Lieberman, the evolutionary biologist at Harvard, who's very concerned about this, wrote a wonderful book recently called The Story of the Human Body, is convinced that we're in a state of dis-evolution and, uh, and writes articulately about that. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is that it's really very easy to fix this. Uh, it's very easy to eat the foods of nature. They're all around us, they're in, in every supermarket, and it's not hard to be physically active. Uh, those are the two biggest things. The other factors of lifestyle like stress and sleep problems and things all are easier to deal with uh, if you have a healthy body, eating healthy nutrition and, uh, and have physical activity. The problem is, is our modern culture, uh, led by the food industry, has really hooked us on refined carbohydrates and sugars, and we're eating an enormous amount of these unhealthy foods uh, fostered uh, by the advertising. Unfortunately, refined carbohydrates, such as coming from grains and sweets, are the most profitable of all food commodities. Uh, the food industry defends them uh, and, and even funds a lot of our academic nutrition centers uh, to kind of keep us in a, uh, in a situation where we have this high refined carbohydrates, a very large glycemic load that results in overweight and obesity. So, There's, Dr. Go Sherman, ahead. I was going to say, with your patients, um, what implications does this have with the care that you're providing your patients? How do you apply that? What I do with all of my patients at any age uh, is I do a body composition, which is very simple. I don't even charge them for it. We have uh, a... Uh, 
technology that's readily available today. You can even buy a scale at Bed Bath & Beyond, which will tell you your body fat. But we use a little better technology that looks at where in your body your body fat is located along with your lean body mass, your muscles. And so I take a picture of a person's uh, body uh, every time I see them as a new patient uh, every year for their annual checkup and even now for patients that I'm in the process of, of reversing the excess body fat and type 2 diabetes, we do it every few months. Uh, but that's a way better picture of your body than simply getting your weight, which is just one number. People are alarmed. I always ask people, how much fat do you think you have on your body? I had a patient last week who weighed way over 200 pounds, and they said, oh, gosh, I'll bet I have 50 or 60 pounds of fat. And the answer was 114, which, uh, which shocked them. Uh, very motivating. But then what we do is go back to eating the foods we were meant to eat, uh, which are mostly healthy fats and avocados and nuts and seeds and, and quality grass-fed uh, meat and wild-caught fish, uh, healthy oils like olive oil or coconut oil. I get all of their refined carbohydrates out of their diet. Uh, the most difficult way to do that is stopping all the, the grains, the breads, the foods made with flour, uh, because that has become such a big part of our culture. I mean, we have birthday cakes and motherhood and apple pie and donuts as rewards and Christmas cookies and pizza parties. I mean, we are awash with these refined carbohydrates. They have a double problem, not only the glycemic load from these foods, but the grains also have inflammatory proteins which cause many GI problems, leaky gut, and even things that lead to autoimmune disease. Uh, Jared Diamond, the famous physiologist anthropologist, said cultivating grasses and turning it into flour was the greatest mistake the human race ever made with respect to its health. Uh, so those are, I get people off of grains, I get people off of sweets, because there's an addiction part of that, it takes a detox, if you will, that takes seven to ten days with patients. I help them through that. Um, the most remarkable thing is that when you give up this glycemic load and your blood sugar starts to stabilize, you're actually never hungry. Um, it's amazing. It's very easy to skip meals. Uh, eating three meals a day is not a biological thing. It's purely a cultural thing. Uh, for Again, as hunter-gatherers, we ate one meal a day, uh, maybe chewing on a few tubers while we were hunting. But uh, we generally hunted, gathered, and feasted. Uh, I try to get my patients down to two meals a day. I do this myself. Uh, it's easy for me to do this because I walk the talk completely with an optimal body weight and optimal body fat, and I'm physically active. So uh, I'm a role model for what they uh, really want to be if my motivational counseling is successful, and uh, we move them in this direction. And uh, they're so amazed at how they just simply don't feel hungry anymore. Uh, how calm they tend to feel. Things don't bother them as much as they used to. Uh, there's a real peace and harmony that comes when you give up uh, foods that drive your blood sugar high. Uh, they, uh, any any uh, pre-diabetes or diabetes uh, disappears, and you can do that within three months for almost every type 2 diabetic. They overcome that insulin resistance. And then, you know, the most exciting new development besides reversing diabetes is the fact that you can actually improve cognitive function in seniors, even reversing early and sometimes moderate Alzheimer's disease by getting the glucose toxicity out of the brain. The brain is stressed by high glucose levels. And if you can get the, the glucose at a stable, normal, low rate with your fasting insulin down at low levels, 
the brain uh, regenerates. It's, there's neurogenesis that goes on with uh, healthy nutrition and, of course, coupled with exercise. And, uh, you know, it's, it's incredibly powerful, exciting, and rewarding to practice intensive lifestyle medicine. So my practice has really shifted to that. I call using drugs to treat chronic disease palliative care. You know, throughout America, and the drug industry loves it and thrives, but all we're doing is palliative care to lifestyle diseases rather than actually treating them to achieve cure. Um, uh, the drug industry doesn't make money from that. The food industry doesn't make money for that. So you've got a couple powerful forces to deal with, but the, the proof is in the results. And I think we have a growing culture of healthy people uh, who are doing this. We certainly have a lot of scholars. In, in my book, Lean and Fit, I don't claim to be an original with any idea, but I, I use and synthesize the scholars, and I call them scholars because their work is very uh, evidence-based. And we'll talk about what evidence-based means in a broad sense. But when we're talking about uh, David Ludwig from Harvard and Daniel Lieberman at Harvard and, and Gerard Mullen at Johns Hopkins and, and, uh, and David Perlmutter, Mark Hyman, uh, you know, the, uh, Dale Bredesen is a neurologist at UCLA. These are very science-oriented people who are data-driven. They're not belief-driven. They're not superstition-delivered. Uh, driven. We have plenty of that out there, but these are people who are data driven. So I have heard from some of the uh, uh, proponents of uh, kind of rigid evidence-based medicine that none of these uh, claims that that you're you're making and that you use in your clinical practice really can be. Uh, uh, Subscribe to broadly until you've had uh, RCT studies that document uh, these kinds of uh, effects. Do you, would you care to comment on that? Yes, I sure would. I think, Larry, that evidence-based medicine is in a rut. Now, I'm, I've always felt to be evidence-based, and I have an enormous respect for evidence-based medicine. I have an enormous respect for randomized controlled trials because they've gotten rid of a lot of myths and beliefs and helped us find truth. But, but randomized controlled trials is not what the history of medicine has been about with respect to discovery. It's only one way of evidence, and it's by and large kind of a looking back uh, way of evidence, again, which I respect and I think are important. But the way the history of medicine has worked from Louis Pasteur to John Lister uh, to others has been to get a better understanding of our biology, to get a better understanding of the biology of nature, uh, and, uh, and, and coupled with some epidemiology population data uh, to better understand the pathophysiology of disease and to get a better understanding of what is going on. And, and let me just give an example from not that long ago. In, in 1922, William Banting at uh, the University of Toronto isolated insulin for the first time. And we know that type 1 diabetes is a deficiency of insulin. So he was able to synthesize insulin in his lab, and he and his colleagues uh, injected insulin into a child with type 1 diabetes, and the child got better. Uh, as kind of a proof of concept, he injected six children, and the six children get, got better, and, uh, and insulin therapy for type 1 diabetes went all over the world as the uh, miracle cure in Nobel Prize winning science. That's empiric research. There was no randomized controlled trial to say, well, you know, was that due to chance or, or uh, uh, how did you prove that insulin really works for type 1 diabetes? I mean, the whole history of medicine from turning off the, uh, the, uh, the faucet with cholera in London to, to uh, cowpox vaccination of uh, the milkmaids, if you will. Uh, I mean, we've, we've uh, developed through a better understanding of, of our science and empiric data, and that should be respected. 
Uh, David Sackett at McMaster was a founder of evidence-based medicine, and I was very fortunate that he was a visiting professor at UCLA when I was a medical student, and I spent a lot of time with him, and I think he would agree with me that evidence-based medicine is in a rut. Uh, he defined evidence-based medicine as using the best available evidence to help guide your clinical decisions. No, no randomized controlled trial, no sort criteria of what's level A. Use the best available evidence, and evidence comes in all shapes and sizes. And I think Sackett would agree with me that, that we've got a conservative, locked-in look at the only evidence that we respect is randomized controlled trials. That's the only thing that breaks through these meta-analysis that, uh, that the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force and the Choose Wisely campaigns who do a lot of good work, but they, they are locked into a limited or narrow view of the evidence. So the other issue that I will hear from people is they may – grudgingly accept that with some patients disease reversal is possible, but then they end up saying, but not with my patients. My patients are different. My patients are poor. My patients, there, there's a number of, of different uh, 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 objections that they uh, raise. What, how would you like to comment on that? Well, uh, you know, first of all, uh, Lieberman, uh, in his book, The Story of the Human Body, I've just finished it twice getting ready for the New York presentation. He said, um, you know, I would, I would borrow from Tolstoy saying healthy bodies are all alike, but sick, bo sick bodies are different uh, in their own unique ways. And I would agree with that. People are complicated. Uh, they all have different stories. They all have different culture that they may be locked into. So practicing lifestyle medicine is a, is a challenge, and you need to individualize your work with every patient. Uh, but our biology doesn't lie. I mean, Sarah Hallberg at Indiana, Jason Fung at Toronto, Eric Westman at Duke, uh, they know that if you get people on a healthy food of nature diet, you get them off of refined carbohydrates as much as possible, uh, things start happening to the body. And, uh, and that is going to be universal. Uh, uh, you know, Dale Bredesen showed that you don't get reversal of cognitive decline until your fasting insulin level drops below 5 and your fasting blood sugar drops below 90. Uh, Fung, uh, Jason Fung shows quite clearly that people don't burn fat and get rid of body fat until their fasting insulin at least gets below 10. The normal fasting insulin goes clear up to over 25. I mean, these are things that are now being biologically worked out, and, um, and they do happen in anybody and everybody. I mean, there's, you know, Ludwig at Harvard has showed that intermittent fasting and getting into a ketotic state, which means you're burning fat for part of the day, is the only method of weight loss that doesn't plateau, uh, that keeps working. And, uh, and they have the evidence to back that up. So they, you know, I think it's really a cop-out for doctors to say, this isn't going to work for me or my patients are, are too low income. Um, I think they're copping out. They're, they're not part of, uh, of the solution today. Uh, I work in a, in a clinic of the poorest of the poor people every month. Uh, these are undocumented uh, migrant farm workers and house cleaners who live in, in the eastern part of our valley, and, uh, and we were in a free clinic for people with absolutely no insurance. And my clinic is filled with people who are trying to lose weight. I'm known as El Doctor No Mas Tortillas, uh, and they kind of make fun of it. But I, and I work, uh, I work against a big challenge. But I got women wanting to get their figures back. I always tell them, "How much did you weigh when you got married, and what you look like?" And uh, and they describe something very different than they are now. And I say, "You haven't lost that figure. You've just coated it." Uh, with pat. Uh, you, you've added all this padding to your figure. And let's burn off this padding by walking and, and giving up the tortillas and the sweets 
and indeed some of them do that and i the head nurse at this clinic who's who's hispanic uh got her figure back so she's now my powerful educator uh i leave her alone i I just look at at um, uh, at Maria and say give please give this lady the talk and so I leave her alone with the patient goes into it in great detail and lo and behold some of them do it I've got guys who want to get their their uh, machismo back they want to look good uh, again and uh, and the pathway is giving up the refined carbohydrates and and uh, and that results in less hunger so they can end up eating less, you eat 35% fewer calories when you give up refined carbohydrates. The carbohydrates drive your hunger. So, uh, uh, you know, magic happens, and that happens in everybody, and you don't need to have uh, wealth to, to do that. So, Dr. Sugar, I'm excited that you're going to be one of our plenary speakers at the uh, 2018 FMEC annual meeting in Westchester. You'll be talking along with Dr. Wayne Jonas on Saturday morning. Um, any words that you'd like to uh, pass on to those who are coming to the meeting? Well, I think it's going to be a really powerful trio that you've lined up for us plenary speakers. Uh, we're going to be talking about how critical it is to get primary care front and center in any health care system. Uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to talk about how healing works, how you need to tap into people's belief structure in order for any therapeutic intervention to work with respect to healing. And then uh, I hope to transmit the, the critical core information to empower the attendees to start practicing lifestyle medicine. So I, I think that the, tr the, the combination is going to be really powerful, and I wish everybody could be there. That's great. Well, Dr. Sugar, thank you so much for joining with us today, and I look forward to uh, uh, seeing you in Westchester. Well, thank you, Larry. It's a it's an honor and a pleasure for me. So you're bringing a Californian uh, clear to the East Coast, and I I uh, I'm already working on my talk. So uh, I look forward to it. Thank you.